Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the Mage of the Ascension 20th Anniversary Rules by Onyx Path Publishing. This actual play is performed by adults and contains adult themes. Our World of Darkness is intended for adults. Listeners should pay close attention to all listed content warnings. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc., which may bear resemblance to entities living or dead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your storyteller. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I am your storyteller this evening, Michael Diamond. My pronouns are he, him, and we are back with another episode in the Ascension of Babylon series, our mage, the Ascension Chronicle. We're so thankful to have you as a listener, and we're extra specially happy to have you as a Patreon supporter. If you haven't had a chance to check out what we offer on Patreon, you can at patreon.com slash the old ways podcast. You can also jump over to YouTube and see some of the things that we do over there, some special stuff as far as uh, conventions and cast interviews, and also join us on Twitch now at the old ways Twitch, uh, twitch.tv slash the old ways Twitch. I promise I will get it right at some point. And now we'll begin cast introductions to my right. Hi, I'm Allie and I play Kaylee Hannah Godfrey. And there was a giant big thing that took me by surprise. Hmm, interesting. Uh, and to Kaylee's right. This is Aleko playing Dante Maxim Vargas Bailey, who has been given the kind of shot that only comes along once in a lifetime for a performer and his pet mink. Fantastic. I'm Bunny. My pronouns are she, her, and I play Dante's tutor, just kind of hoping that he doesn't break his body before I get a good crack at his mind. Well, I mean, we can't wait on that. Uh, to Bunny's right. This is Jake. I'm playing Oliver Devereaux. And last game, we got the band together, had a few laughs, you know, good times. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. This is to say nothing of that enormous sphere that was in the background. Minor thing. Right. Uh, to, <laughs> to Oliver's right. Hello, this is Silas, and I am playing the artist currently known as Suits. Yes, Suits. Can't wait to see what that turns into. To Suits, right? Hi, this is James, and I'll be playing Adam Harrison, who uh, I guess can sum his previous experience up with, what the hell was that, and get your lips off of it. Hmm, that seems pretty succinct. And last but most certainly not least. Hi there. I am Rosie of Odd Duck Dice, and tonight I am playing Jules, Adam's avatar, who has no real response to anything about anyone's lips because they're your lips. Do do whatever you're going to do with your lips. Live your life. Make sure you write that down, Adam. So when last we left our mages and their avatars... We had just at a cafe scene just off the strip had seen something glorious, terrifying, new and wondrous, all sorts of potential adjectives we could add to it. But the sphere, this object that has been being built on the landscape of Las Vegas had suddenly blossomed into existence. And it was something that not only our mages in the fleshy physical world saw, but also something illuminating that our avatars saw on their side of the astral. That strange plane which none of our none of our mages can currently go to, but perhaps some can see little wisps of energy crackle here and there. And then everybody left because, well, life's got a list and everybody's got shit to do. And the one person who probably has the most to do to prepare for tomorrow is Dante. Because tomorrow's a big day. And wouldn't you know, before you can even blink, Dante, the 5.30 a.m. alarm is here. It is September 29th, 2023, and it's game day. 
So how do you approach the big day? It would be too much to consider the the potential outcomes. So uh, we will do our best to set that aside. And we're going to focus on uh, organization and preparation. Really boring stuff. Because uh, he was warned about the height of the venue and how they were deliberately avoiding, you know, aerial acts out of safety concerns. So his focus outside of showmanship, outside of fame, is and considering, well, the trauma that got him here and the fact that his face sometimes still reminds him that it wanted to get pushed through the back of his head. His thoughts go to his routine and to the inspection because the crews would have been working basically all night to get the, the rig configured for him. Um, the only, I guess the only box that Dante wants to make sure he has checked because he can't focus on it later uh, is trying to make sure that he can get tickets for his parents, his two oldest siblings, uh, his nephew, and his three fellow head cases. Yeah. Head cases. So you'd have gotten word early, maybe late last night, maybe early this morning. Depends on really when you went to sleep. You'd have gotten a text. Um, it would have been from... Probably mm. would have been from Miguel. Probably playing on his mom's phone. And it would have been a picture of the big screen television in the new apartment. And he's even like got the phone turned around. Yeah, but it's too big. And like he's trying to take a selfie with the television. It's enormous. It's got to be like a 65 inch television. He can't take a picture of the entire thing. Good. And you can see he's like posed, his like chest out. You know, the little kid, like Superman pose. And you get that picture. And that's sort of probably what you wake up to. And then the text below it is, I love this new place. Well, I will, uh, my response will be um, good <laughs> because it's all we get. <laughs> uh, don't break it. As far as the setup goes, um, it probably starts. They probably work the overnight. Um, pretty common, actually, in the convention and setup space when it comes to Las Vegas. Not uncommon for crews to work um, until 10 or 11. Um, all those crews generally, when they work convention space, are union crews. And so they're going to work probably from like like a like a three to maybe three. Or so there might be a late shift of folks that start at seven and work all the way basically until dawn. It all depends on what the convention space needs. Now, the win is a convention space, of course, but the roof space is not, right? So it's a little special about what's going on up here. As far as your access to the space, um, you, you're not sure exactly when you're allowed to come and go, but you've been told you have access. You'd have to actually go check it out. Yep, I would, uh, once, once I feel confident that I have everything Warmed up in the morning, I will do my uh, morning affirmations. I will stare at Tudor in the mirror, you know, while I'm kind of washing my face and thinking through what what needs to be done. So I have a question. I might have an answer. There's a part of me that really wants to do this, like, I want to say on my own because somehow I feel like what we can do is cheating. I, I know it's not like I understand that it's not but you, you know what I mean like the other performers are doing their absolute best and I'm going to do mine but there's a lot on the line there's a lot on the line I think that you should consider that your new abilities are part of what makes your best yours and so while the others might be doing their best you might have ways to ensure that it goes even better for everyone. And that's just part of your best. I wouldn't know, I wouldn't feel comfortable trying a, a new tool in the middle of the performance, but right now, right now would be, this would this would be the time. Because my, my body feels ready, but I mean, I'm, I'm sure you know how I'm not at peace at all. So um, I'm gonna need your eyes to make sure that everything's gonna go okay because I am not going through that stage again. I've already woken up once. I think that 
I will do my best to be here while you prepare. And I will do my best to be your eyes while you're getting on, uh, getting ready to perform, getting on the stage as it were, though I know it's not a real stage in this case. But honestly, I'm a little worried I might distract you while you're actually doing it. I've taken you off guard so many times at this rate that we've been going that I feel like most of our prep that involves me in any way should likely happen beforehand. Would you not agree that I've distracted you? Well, well yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. You're distracting me now, but it's, 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 it's I, I need it. Okay. There's no one else here. So uh, I'm going to go fetch Sophie and the three of us. I'm going to keep talking to Tudor on my way there. I'll, I'll take the long walk. Uh, to the wind, and then I'm just going to start basically inspecting the equipment. And what I'm hoping to be able to do um, is, you know, based on on you know Dante's knowledge of the equipment and how it's supposed to work, and his mastery of his craft, with his focus being on the equipment itself, and when he grabs ropes and, and is confident that these things will hold, I would like to try again to to. In, you know, through his avatar to, to empower himself, to be more perceptive, to be more aware of what could happen, of what might happen. Yeah, so that's, I would I would like to try uh, to empower myself. Okay, it's so like a mind one effect? Yes. Yeah, sure. So it's coincidental. Difficulty four. I guess you're plus three. It's two. I can put them into perception, right? Mm-hmm. Those two. Okay. I will just, that's purely what I'm focusing on is inspecting every anchor, the frames, the pulleys, the securing pins, the pistons in the damn jump pads and the frame erector, all the cables, all the handles, like everything. So for you, Tudor, what you see is Dante's eyes begin to dart around a little bit and then you feel yourself the self, which is the avatar, get bifurcated. Mm. Like you feel your essence move and change. And this is the way it's supposed to work. He, you are part of that malleable clay for him to utilize. And you feel what he needs. What he needs is to be able to see what perhaps could be missing. What, what could be hidden. And you watch as his you know, the eyes sort of gain additional facets just behind the lens of the eye, not exposed to the public. Mm-hmm. A nice, reasonably safe effect. Very well done. Uh, and then, yeah, if you if, if you want to roll perception to inspect things, I guess perception gymnastics. Sure. Uh, gymnastics is a is a specialty under acrobatics, uh, so it just that just means that tens or two, right? Yep. Okay. So difficulty is six. Is that correct? Diff seven. Seven. Okay. Two. Standard Three, difficulty four. in twenty is is uh, seven. Five. So five. Okay. Uh, once once I didn't roll any ones. Hey, that's kind of cool. Okay. So yeah, five. That is cool. So Tudor Dante does it right. And not only does he do the magic right, he puts it into use correctly. Well done. Yeah, there's no issue with the pistons. There's no issue with the, with the ropes, with the landings, with, with any of it. All of it has been set up by someone who knows what they're doing, by someone who is good at what they do. There are some adjustments that you make. Those are personal adjustments, but they're not ones you have to make because something is faulty. As long as this stuff is as it is now, when you start your routines, everything is in place. As far as what could go wrong, well, where do you want to start? I mean, every single rope, every single piece of equipment is a potential failure point. So if you are bouncing off of this pad and you are leaping through the air, If, for whatever reason, it doesn't go right, you could land on your face. There is protective netting that is up 
maybe eight or nine feet on the side of the, you know, this roof, but it's not foolproof. It, it's it, also not tall enough. It's not. No, because people, the guests watching want to be able to see the sphere. And right. if you put up 20 foot netting, you're going to block the sphere. Oh, uh, I'd also like to note that the seats that I got, my friends and, and family, I was hoping I'd be able to get as many as I wanted because I'm actually specifically asking to put them in the risers, which is the last place you want to be on a rooftop. Like it's the worst seat possible. But I don't want them to have perfect seats for the stage. I want them to be eye level like 10, 15 feet off the lip of, of the building. Basically where I intend to be or die. So it's, it's kind of what happens there. Okay. You're able to obtain six tickets. Okay. You'll have to decide who they go to. Yeah, my parents, older brother, and again, the my three miscreants. Okay. We'll, we'll leave you there for just a moment. Early morning inspecting things. Adam, there is nothing like waking up in Echo Park. There's nothing like waking up in a trailer park when your neighbor a few doors down tends to celebrate with gunfire. Gunfire. Now, you have known John for a long time. You've lived here. Your dad knew John. And John's on SSI. And he has very few cares in life. The one thing that he enjoys doing, though, is greeting the morning. Every now and again, with a few rounds, he'll squeeze out of one of the, what he calls Civil War revolvers that he has. It's not actually a Civil War revolver. It's styled to look like one in the sense that the frame looks like a revolver from the era. But what gives it away is the clear and immediate like American flag coloring that's been done on the, down the barrel. Uh, it's a little ghastly, but so yeah, you wake up gunshot. It sounds odd, but this is a gunshot that I by now probably recognize. This isn't a foreign gunshot. This is like, you know, you can tell your neighbor's backfiring car. You can tell when the guy down the street has, you know, hasn't replaced the muffler yet. Stumble over to the window, out of, roll out of bed, stumble over to the window, throw it open. John, you've got to give it a rest, buddy. You see him. He has traditional, his traditional Crocs on. They're stylized with little cowboy boot buttons. Um, he's in also his American flag, um, you know, bathrobe. And he is cooking breakfast. We'll just leave that in air quotes. On his grill. And occasionally firing a gun into the air. He turns when he hears you. Huh? I said, I just woke up. Give it a rest. The gun. He nods. and I know it's puts it down next towards the, it puts it down on the, on the side of the grill and you're. Thanks a bunch, Bear Patton. You've done us all a service. He closes the window and throws on yesterday's shirt and, Oh. grabs a granola bar and a half of cuff of what is ever in the coffee pot at this point and uh, stumbles outside. Okay, stumble outside. It's definitely morning. John, listen, huh? head over to the grill. Huh? Hey, listen, you're going to hurt somebody with that thing. And you, you got to stop, man. You, you can't keep waking me up with a revolver. He he picks it up and sort of turns towards you. He keeps the gun pointed to the ground. He's not pointing it at you. He, his wrist, though, is a little low, and you're you're kind of worried that maybe he doesn't have a good grip on it right now. He's a um, permanent 5 o'clock shadow. He has a goatee, really long gray hair that sort of runs off into a ponytail. Um, his hairline has receded much like um, you know, the Germans from Stalingrad after losing that portion of the war. Um, <laughs> he looks at you, and when he does, you watch 
his eyes swirl and then flick back into focus. I haven't slept in a few days. Yeah, you uh, you look like you maybe you could. Re- Why don't you have a seat? I'll, I'll flip the sausages. How about that? Um, you look at the grill, and there's not what you would call traditional food on that grill. What you do see is a 12, maybe 13 inch long um, baby alligator. Not baby, but a young gar gator on it. Hmm. Adam carefully lifts it with the tongs so he can inspect it. 100% blasted. Is it the whole, it's, like, it's the whole gar? Yeah, it's like 100 Has not been eviscerated, <laughs> and eviscerated or anything? No, no it's, a, it's, a, it's a toy, perhaps a model. Okay, okay. Uh, well, that's not better, but worrying in a different way. Um, you see him sit down in like one of those pale yellow metal chairs with like the decoration on the back and the, the arms. Um, it's probably been out here baking in the sun for, you know, 20 years, but it sort of cracks when he sits down in it. The revolver eventually like falls out of his hand. Adam goes over and crouches down next to John. Puts his hand on his shoulder. Hey, hey why, don't, why don't you, um, why don't you get a little rest, huh, buddy? Hmm? Do you have any medicine, Adam? Um, actually, medicine is one of the few books that Adam could not get his hand on. Okay, so just give me a um, perception and awareness roll. Perception and awareness? I can do that. Two successes. If you didn't know it any better, you'd think he was, he's probably on some pretty serious stuff. He's got a lot of physical, physiological, physiological traits that are showing right now. Like he's a little sweaty. It's not warm yet. And John's a local. So like he doesn't actually get worried about the heat until many, many hours beyond this. There's something on like the side of his five o'clock shadow here that's dark. The left hand side. I assume that uh, John is not offering very much resistance. He's barely conscious. <laughs> Turns his head to let, take a closer look. There's something black pouring out of his ear. All right. Well, I mean, it's the third worst thing I've seen pouring out of someone's ear here in Echo Park. So it's still alarming. Uh, so alarming. So let's um, not touch it. Find a cloth of some sort, kind of wipe it off of his the side of his neck. Mm-hmm. As you're turning to look for something, that cloth, a uh, cute little fuzzy paw is right there, and it has it for you. Oh, it's it's stained, but it's there. Thanks, Jules. Oh. Jules, hey. Oh my god, am I glad to see you. Fuck me, am I glad to see you. Hi, I am hang on. I'm I gotta I, gotta, I hope this isn't something this guy needs. Kind of scoops the black stuff off of his neck and ear and <laughs> cleans him up a little bit, washes the side of his neck with a Miller light from the can he was <laughs> that was next to the grill. He won't notice that he smells a little more like beer. And I'm just going to hang on to this. That way I stop waking up at 7 a.m. to cannon fire. I mean, uh, yeah, that's, that's that's definitely a good thing to not let him have. Yeah. But, like, you should maybe turn the grill off and see what you can do to help him, like, get some shut eye, maybe. Alligator's not done yet. I don't think it's cooking. Oh, it smells like it's cooking. Uh, but you're right. Turn off the Adam turns off the grill, picks Jules up, and puts Jules on his shoulder. I told you I piss on you the next time you did that. Uh huh. And I don't fear that because you're full of cotton and cigarette butts. Pokes Jules in the tummy, like me. So let's. I think we should look in here. Honestly, he goes over regardless of how Jules is 
<laughs> struggling to not be on his shoulder and heads to John's trailer. He's going to open the door and take a look inside. Okay. So um, you can imagine from the way John sort of presents himself, his trailer is likely a complete collection of wondrous oddities. Um, living on Social Security out in a trailer park does not afford you many fineries, um, even less when you have a difficult time when it comes to alcoholism and a feverish love of firearms. But John's trailer is actually cleaner than you'd expected. In fact, if you didn't know it any better, it sort of smelled like Lysol in here. That's a that's an empty bottle of Lysol. Adam begins to move much more carefully here and not be on the foyer too much. Well, there's not much of a grand entrance to this, you know, single wide trailer, but well, there's no there's no like boot room next to the den. This is I mean, I can't work like this. <laughs> OK, um, he scans around the trailer for things that are out of place. Um, other than the cleanliness, which is obviously out of place, but he's probably actually seen more than one crime scene. And has this place been worked over? And I mean, are the doorknobs all clean? Are the edges of door frames clean where they wouldn't be, where hands would go? Yes. And yes. In fact, the only thing you find that is a little strange is at a tiny desk that, well, if it can really be called a desk, it's more like a movable TV tray. But there is something there in a bag nearby, a brown paper bag. Uh, you, it doesn't take a Sherlock Holmes to see that there's a crumpled bag, sort of a little out of place, kind of tucked to the side of the couch. Adam starts to take a goes to take a step onto the carpet and stops for a minute. Okay, this 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 is one of those. <laughs> See, I've been studying jewels. He looks at the object over there, and he wants to bring it over here with his newfound grasp of space. Ooh, okay, it's not very big. Not uh, no. And there's nobody looking but Jules. As far as you're aware, yes. As far as I know. So let me let me make sure that you're mm. you're set to do this, right? So if you're going to um, attempt to sort of reach through space and move those points from one place to another, so that way you are closer to it without physically moving, you. You could potentially do that with correspondence magic. Um, if you're going to attempt to retrieve something through there, you're going to need matter to bring it to you. Mm, that's true, and I don't have any matter. It'll also be, it will also be vulgar without witnesses. As shit. Because that's, uh. that's not consensual. <laughs> the rug is not okay with that. Okay. Me and the rug are going to have to talk later. But um, for now, he doesn't want to really... All right. You could, I will say this, you could open a correspondence window with correspondence That's two. That's more what he's right. thinking is rather than bring it to him Look at it. as in break down and transport, but a, a correspondence hole. Yes. Yeah, you could you could open a window. Okay. But we have to like talk about how you're going to do that. He's going to give that a shot. Okay, so tell me how. Justify the effect. Okay. He clears his mind closes his eyes, uh, thinks about the size of the room and how and everything that the books he's been reading and Jules has been teaching that reality is a lot more fluid, it seems, than he has been told, including space and seemingly time. But he's not really worried about time right now. He's just got to get that thing from over on the other side of the room. So he wants to... 
essentially eliminate the space between his hand and the object, pinching them together. Okay, so what is your focus for correspondence? Focus for correspondence is the uh, book that he has, the um, How to Open Your Mind. And (laughs) so he takes it out and he's thumbing through it as he's holding his other hand out and uses the teachings in there about closing his eyes, using his breath, and attempting to do something that previously he would have thought impossible. Okay. Roll Arate. Uh, So it's just you imagining it essentially in your mind. Um, You're sort of opening this wall of correspondence, and perhaps you'll flip to a page and be able to see what, what is revealed in the bag. Uh, he he is specifically um, trying to read, or he's reading about the calling out into the universe and pulling thing towards you. That's an Arte roll. An eight and a three, so one success. Okay, so you flip the page, and and for you, Jules, you see what 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 he's trying to do. You get the energy he's trying to call on, right? He's trying to, with correspondence magic, bridge the gap between the two spaces. Um, It's a minor victory, not probably um, as strong of an output as he could, but you help him get to the right page. Your fingers sort of fly over the pages in the book. You lose the chapter in the space you were in, Adam. And when you open the book, you see an image there And that image is of a hypodermic needle and a needle which has been used. And there is a faint, dark substance that still resides within a portion of that injection device. And will attempt to reach, to to project his vision into more than vision and attempt to reach through and grab gently and carefully, not just because he's afraid of losing a hand suddenly. Uh, He's he's seen all of those Marvel movies and whatnot, but also because he doesn't know what the hell is in that thing and he really doesn't want to get stabbed, but he attempts to bring it through to him. Or can it not be brought through because of no yeah, matter? Yeah, because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's if it's just a window, it's just a window for you to see through. Okay, when you have when, right. you, have, That's when you have matter, you can pull stuff through. I concur, and I and I love the idea of your character seeing it in the book and then going okay, and you're just kind of pressing your hand against it, and it looks just kind of silly and impotent. Yep, and then he looks for a moment kind of frustrated and slightly dejected, and then he realizes that he's still seeing it. Yeah, it's still really cool. I I mean, you're you're not there yet, buddy. But I get the idea, cause you see something, you want something, you reach for it. But uh, you you don't have that reach yet. But the sand's cool. Yeah, it's better than nothing, right? And what the hell is that? <laughs> Turns the book towards Jules. I don't know. You're you're, uh, you're probably still gonna have to go open the bag. Yeah, fuck it. He just walks across the room and opens the bag. <laughs> Walk across the room, you open the bag. You see the used hypodermic needle. You see the reds do. You don't see something you think you would see. You don't see a spoon. You don't see like the. What you're expecting is a hair a heroin kit. There's no kit here. There's no kit here. He's known more than one junkie. Oh, yeah. It strike you as weird, Jules. You know, in for a penny, in for a pound. He goes into his bathroom, the bathroom area, the little, I'm sure it's like one of those little stall. Mm-hmm. Um, is there a medicine cabinet area in um, there? There is a medicine cabinet in there. The first thing that you get hit by when you get into the bathroom is the smell of bleach. <sighs> That's two. He opens the medicine cabinet a varying number of um, prescription pills are in here um, stuff for high blood pressure stuff for cholesterol and that's three he walks he grabs a high blood pressure med and he comes back out in the living room he puts it down in front of Jules junkies don't get blood pressure medication refilled 
They don't give a shit about their heart. <laughs> he tosses the blood pressure meds behind him. Well, uh, does, does your neighbor live alone normally? Yeah, and a lot less clean than this. Did you check for a pulse? I mean, like, I know you saw him walking around and, and stuff. He sticks his head out the window and, using life, looks at John. Okay. You turn on your life senses. Uh, life vision tingling. <laughs> John's body is a husk. The inside of it has been eaten away. Like, imagine... Imagine a chocolate Easter bunny that's been hollowed out. And all there is is just the frame, the lattice work that would normally keep this confectionery creation together. John is a husk. He turns and looks back at Jules. Uh, I don't think we have to worry about John. Well, uh... We actually kind of probably do, because y- y- if uh, if he's like that and he's walking around and there's black shit coming out of his ears, that's not good. Actually, this is Echo Park, and I don't think anyone will notice for a while. You know, he lives next door to you, right? And that that concerns me. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> I'm going to leave the two of you there just for the moment, okay? Oliver? You're at the safe house, quote unquote, uh, that John Crescent set up for you. Mm -hmm. That's where you've been staying. Uh, I wonder how you're spending the morning. Um, I am practicing. Okay, practicing what? Magic. You know, mostly sensing. Sensory magics are good. Okay, so what are, what spheres are we utilizing? Uh, I want to kind of run the, uh, I don't know, the gamut as much as I want to see. I want to look at uh, the world around me with the different uh, entropy and forces, prime. Yeah, so forces magic is going to be real simple inside here, especially sensory forces magic. Um, this is this space is attuned to the hermetic ways. And so seeing the electricity in the walls is easier here. Moving your vision into that thermoptic that you used back at the trailer in Echo Park with with Adam. That's super easy in here. It does give you a lot of information about this space. It also reveals some things that you weren't necessarily aware of the first few times. There are a lot of, especially when you look with Prime, there are a lot of almost like mousetraps in here. That's what your brain sees. It looks like you're in a box. And the box is surrounded with tiny mouse traps. Like maybe to catch something. I mean, you might have to ask John about it, but he did say that the place was meant to keep people sort of off the radar. Okay, all right. Yeah. As far as entropy goes, but nothing in here is, and that might be the most interesting thing, nothing in here is decaying. It's all very, um, not static so much as... uh... Mm, Static's a word for it, right? So even the food that's in the fridge isn't decaying. Hmm. And that is a little strange to you. Although you haven't really test drove like the whole entropy sense just yet. But even in here, you can tell, like you can see the, that there's some sort of aura on your body. And you get a sense that the, almost like when you rub your fingertips together, there's almost like a very fine and almost imperceptible dust that comes off of them. And when you're reaching out with entropic senses, you get the feeling like even I'm decaying. You're aging. Just like almost everything, almost every living thing on the planet. But the in, the in, inanimate objects here don't seem to do that. It's almost as if their state is locked. 
Okay. All right. That's an interesting. I don't know what the point of that is. Maybe to reduce uh, maintenance. It could be. Anyhow. Maybe somebody has a real love for mid-century modern furniture and they don't want it to go bad. Yeah, that could be. Why not? Everything in here is mid-century modern, so. I mean, obviously they uh, took the time to uh, decorate it. So it's quite possible that it's been decorated this way since the mid-century. When you start to think about how old Crescent is, I mean, he's a guy probably in his 50s or 60s. And so while he doesn't fit the bill, like, age-wise, you could imagine that his parents grew up probably, you know, buying a house during during that era. Maybe he grew up in a house that, you know, that had a lot of that furniture. So maybe that's why it is. It's hard to tell. But there's a lot of stuff going on in here. Um, you could probably spend hours intricately looking at all of these different things. The fridge um, and the freezer is probably the most interesting thing because there are layers of energy um, stuff that you don't even understand. You can see that it's powered, that there's threads of this energy that run into the thing that aren't electricity, but you don't know what it does. I think I need to learn more about the fundamentals. And you know what that means? I do. I need a library. Okay. And I happen to know where a library is at. You certainly do. Are you going to take a small jaunt? I am going to take a small jaunt. Okay. You get dressed, put on the red jacket, all that. Step out of the house. You just walk down to the library. Yeah. Because, of course, your car is a little... Right. You know, a little missing. I can't Uber anywhere because I don't have an account anymore that I can access. So, yeah. Okay. You take a walk. You walk for maybe a couple of blocks. The library is probably four or five blocks down the way. It doesn't take you more than, say, like a couple of blocks before I ask you for a perception and awareness test. Very good. Very good. Two successes. You feel it just a moment before it happens. You feel the wave of energy come at you. It's almost like getting spooked. You hear a car honk from behind you. I jump to the side. It's a stationary vehicle. It's a relatively nondescript gray sedan. Nick, as you're walking, it has somehow managed to get behind you. It's probably maybe 10 feet from where you're walking. You turn around and see it. It's a male driver. Throw my hands up like, what? What? You hear the car park, like you hear the transmission change. And a guy in a blue-gray suit steps out. He hasn't said a word yet. Hey, can I help you? Oliver Devereaux? I don't know who that is. I thought you might say that. He steps, like, over the boulevard space to get to the sidewalk where you're walking. He keeps about 10 or so feet from you. He steps on but doesn't come closer. My name is Frank Garvin. I'd like to talk to you if you've got a moment. Man, I'm just walking here. Is that a yes or a no? What do you want to talk about? I want to talk about what happened at 645 Lake Lane. Mm, doesn't ring a bell. It rang a whole lot of alarms when the house blew up. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, you know, I think I read something about that. Yeah, I'm sure you did. Well, one thing, though, he produces a cell phone and he flips it over like to face you and you see the house explode mm -hmm. and you see yourself propelled out of it all in high definition. Everything. That's crazy what those AIs can do nowadays, huh? I mean, do you honestly think that if I had been propelled out of an exploding house like that, I'd just be walking around? No. 
I think it's surprising what any human could do when their genius awakens. Excuse me? You can continue to play dumb, Oliver. That's fine. Tell John I said hi. I'll do that. Frank Garvey, right? Mm Mm-hmm. He turns around and gets back into his car. You head on to the library. Yeah. A little quicker. Now, you arrive uh, at the library probably minutes after that. Um, And you see John and his wife sort of sorting books and doing normal librarian things. It is a private library, so there's no, like, shush rule either, at least in the mundane space. Hey, John. Hey. Oh, uh, Oliver. Uh, we were just, uh, we were just talking about you. Oh, yeah? Mm Mm-hmm. Nothing good, I hope. Oh. Oh, no, actually, um, we were, uh, we were super happy to hear that you've, um, found yourself a space. Yeah, I think it's really going to uh, fit me well. Hey, uh, I just got done talking to a friend of yours. A friend? Yeah, uh, Frank Garvey. Garvey. He sort of furrows his brow. I don't think the word I would use is friend. What did Frank have to say? Uh, he had a video of me at the house. Hmm. He asked some questions. I, you know, played it dumb, but uh, obviously he knew what was going on. It's probably long since time we had a, a discussion about some of that. Yeah, I think so. Come into the library, then. He walks towards the back space where you know where the larger part of his library is. He opens up the doors, and the two of you step in, and you see that there's a model train set that's been put up in the middle of the space. You like trains? (laughs) No, but my nephew does. Ah, that's fair. You might, you got the space, might as well use it, right? Space is something that we definitely have here. So, it's important to understand, like I've, we've talked about before, that there are different sides to this thing we call life as an awakened. Frank is um, an agent. He is a member of the technocracy. So that would be a different side? Hmm. Yes. So while myself and many of the Order of Hermes have very specific views on how things are supposed to be done, certain processes... The technocracy have their own process. They believe in science, not will. Um, And they are always actively recruiting. Oh, so if uh, Frank had gotten a hold of me first, it's likely I may have joined their side. It's certainly possible. Although I'm not certain that they would appreciate your... Uh, failure to follow all of the rules of life. Oh, okay. I, I, I kind of get you. Yeah. I've run into a few of those people. He's a member of the New World Order. No, wait, wait. So the New World Order is real? Yes. Huh. It came out of the Order of Reason several hundred years ago. And the reason, War of Reason came first and eventually birthed the Technocratic Order, which is now called the Technocracy, which is a, an alignment of five specific technocratic traditions. And they use science. Five fingers, one fist. Seem kind of seems like they have a leg up. It sure does, but it doesn't mean they're right. I mean, I kind of get that, the whole uh, sufficiently advanced technology. Blah. It's more than, more than a few blah blahs. Oliver, I've lost friends to Frank. Oh, so it's that serious? Certainly. I mean, I think that would be something you would open with, wouldn't it? You know, before you uh, join uh, this group, just so you know, there's people trying to kill us. They're not trying to kill us anymore. Not as actively. Remember what I said to you when you first came to the library and talked about this, that the war is over. 
there are certain traditions within the nine mystic traditions that don't believe that. There are certain houses within the Order of Hermes that don't believe the war is over. I told you that, too. Okay, all right, yeah. I don't think Frank is interested in shooting anyone. But I do think that he is prepared to do his job and what the technocracy believe in. And that is to protect reality at all costs. And when some will workers tap into that font of phenomenal cosmic power that they have inside of themselves, and when they want something very badly, reality can suffer for it. So who does he say won the war? I don't think he uh, said anybody won the war. He said it was over. They, Someone tends to win. Well, yeah. I guess winning is a uh, eye of the beholder. You say it with a, more of a uh, detente? I would say that the technocracy believes they won the war. And I think that it would be very easy to agree with them. But if they won and they found their grand consensus, these sort of gestures, you know, to the audience, which is not here, then tell me why they have not taken control of everything. They believed in all of their heart, as mechanized as it is, that they won. But if they did, show me where. That is what they struggle with to this day. There's no uh, grand ascension, as it were. I think, I think that ascension is a personal struggle. A road one person walks. This business about the entirety of humanity ascending at once. It's too difficult. I think that is something that many of us have come to understand. You might call it defeat, but I think even mages, perhaps especially mages, need to guard themselves against their own expectations for grand power. It isn't all delivered at once. That seems feasible. It seems like a good idea. I mean, everybody's got their own, uh, you know, thing, as it were. Yes. Frank does. You do. I do. Everyone does. The sooner you understand that and live by it, the better. Now, you came here for a reason? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm going to uh, look into expanding my knowledge of this brand new world that I have entered. Of course, the fever for knowledge gets us all. There are very few rules for hermetic mages, only about 72 of them that persist to this library, but the one you must follow is books do not leave my library. And I'll know if they do. Very well. We have a storehouse of knowledge here, one which can shepherd you to new enlightenment but it must stay here. No pictures either. That's fair. Okay. Oh, and um, seeing as that you're a um, newly awakened mage and now a new member of the Order of Hermes, I will require, um, as for use of the library in one month's time, uh, three pieces of TAS. Excuse me? TAS. Concentrated primal energy. Oh. I can help show you that process in time. And provided you cannot reach that ability just yet, we will put you on a specific plan. TAS is concentrated primal energy. It's useful for creating things like wards around a house you don't want people to get into. Or perhaps 
a fridge that always seems to have fresh food. All those things take energy. You'll be allowed to take some of the library's energy for your uses, but you're expected to give back that energy. Tell. Keep it running. Yeah, the man's always got to get his cut. A small price to pay for hundreds of years of mystical knowledge at your fingertips. Okay. All right. If you feel it is unfair, I am happy to renegotiate it. Well, we'll, we'll see how, uh, how this plays out for a while. Good. Away you go. Hey, I got one more question for you. Certainly. I was checking out the wards. That's what you call them, wards? In the uh, safe house? Yes. And there's these little mousetrap-like things. Mm-hmm. Do those, like, catch uh, snooping knives, as it were? Could. If they snoop too close, yes. When you met Frank, was it this morning on the way here? Yeah. Do you ever wonder why it might not have been at the front door? Well, it was a safe house. I would assume that there wasn't anybody uh, that knows where we are. Or if they know of the safe house, they know better than to tread on the wards. Oh, okay, I see. Wouldn't want a gas leak. And, um, while I am mostly a humble bookkeeper, I am still a member of the Order of Hermes. Okay, well, on that note, I'm going to go uh, do some studying. You do that. Okay, Kaylee. Let's discuss your evening previous and up to today. You decided that it would be a good idea to get your investigatory meat hooks into one Oliver Devereaux. And so you've utilized certain contacts and backgrounds to gather the information that you can. That has been given to you in your personal channel. You're aware of it. And so now you may act on that. Now, tell me how you'd like to further that investigation. Well, I officially have his full name now. Yep. And there was a technique that I utilized to find a previous skip, which is essentially following a life path, tracing of it. And I'd like to go and see if I can't find out where his car has be, been like repossessed to. Okay. So that I can find the start of the trail and have it lead me back to him. Okay. So you have some potential there. Um, what would you be utilizing to do so mystically? combination of life one and prime one uh, life one basically makes it so that I can sense life in prime one with a combination of that will allow me to read quintessence in you know a hidden manner because it's not like traditional humans are going to be able to see it so I'm going to be combining those two things in order to see a physical for me trail that will take me to him. I think it's probably much more likely that it would end up using prime magic. You don't really have a a piece of him to focus your life magic with, like to focus on. Um, there's no like actual, like if you had like a, if you had a piece of his hair, it'd be totally different. Um, but that's the point of going to the car. Right. I get that. So you find out that his car has been impounded. Getting to the impound yard is where you're going to start. Like there at the gate at the police impound. <laughs> so the police impound here is a a wide section of a covered and uncovered parking lot, basically, where cars sit behind chain link fences. There's a guard station, there's a gate arm, there's a walk up or a drive up. 
okay, well then I guess I'm going to walk up and see if I can't get inside the lot to track down Oliver's car. Okay. The um, police officer at the gate sort of waves you up to the front desk. How can I help you? He seems to like write something down. Uh, I'm looking for a car that's been impounded. The name on it is Oliver Devereaux. Mm -hmm. You got a make and model? I don't think I do, storyteller, do I? Mm, Probably not. Uh, No, unfortunately I don't. Okay. He looks up from his desk and says, you work in a case or? Yeah. Okay, you got a case ID number? I don't have a case ID number. I'm a bounty hunter. Bail bondsman. Yeah. Unless you're Boba Fett. No, that would make things easier, wouldn't it? Okay. Um, why don't you give me a... I think you can go one of two ways, right? You could go the charisma route. Mm-hmm. Or, or you could potentially go the legal route. I guess the question is, is which route do you think Kaylee would take? Like, would you press hard on the idea that, hey, listen, I'm just working a case. I need to get to this car. Or would you try to exert some sort of legal pressure in which to get? Because it's a police impound. So you don't have the right as a bail bondsman to just go in there. No. Because it's a police. It's it's run by the Las Vegas Police Department. Right. Chances are very good that I would just... I wouldn't use the legal angle specifically just because that doesn't necessarily always get me places. So I would see what I could do um, otherwise. Okay. So you can try to fast talk, et cetera, this uh, police officer? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So could be subterfuge, could be, I mean, pick, pick a charisma-based skill. Or a manipulation-based skill. You can, you can do manipulation subterfuge if you want. Pull up some sort of sob story or perhaps a crafty story. Like, hey, this guy beat up a cop. Help me find him. Doesn't that be true? Oh, no, I would I would use the truth that he's wanted for questioning for an explosion. That's, that's a pretty serious matter. So I would definitely use... Um, Manipulation subterfuge okay. for that. So it's difficulty seven. Okay. Uh, I have two successes. He looks uh, looks over at you and says, uh, "Yeah, I heard about that. The uh, one of the guys on beat said that uh, they caught him in his house at one point, and then he poofed." All right. Tell you what. You want to check the car out? That's fine. Check it out. From the outside, right? No Mm -hmm. no funny business. You have five minutes. Okay. It gives you the lane and lot number that it's in. All right. I will go to the lane and lot number. Hey, Jake, what kind of car does Oliver or did Oliver drive? Um, I'm going to say Mazda Protégé. Okay. You find a Mazda Protégé parked. Okay. Are any of the, do any of the windows happen to be down? No. Okay. What color is this car? All right. So is it, is it early enough in the day that I will be able to see fingerprints on the handle or on the doors itself via reflection of the sun? Yeah, you can probably see that there are fingerprints on the, uh, probably near the driver's window. And All right, then I have a question, storyteller. Is that enough for me to be able to utilize life as well? It is a physical part of him. It's an oil, potentially, of him. Yeah, I, I think that, I think it's enough for life magic. I think okay. it's mystical enough for you to potentially get a, get some sort of thread or lead on it. You're going to have to roll Arate for your yeah. life sensing magic and uh, it's highest fear plus three so 
it's target number four. And then what I want to know is what what is your focus and how are you doing that? Uh, so my focus is, is that I wrote his name on a piece of paper so that I would be able to specifically focus on his name to lead me to wherever he is. Okay, so your your life that's your life focus is what writing or Mhm. Okay. Two. Okay. You get a little tangible thread from it. So you get a spark based off of this series of fingerprints. It certainly is nowhere near here. But it does give you a slight trail to follow. Then I'll follow that trail to wherever it ends. Okay. You begin following that trail. You will end up following it for most of your evening until it eventually just dissipates. About, well, some like in the middle of the street somewhere. You're in a residential neighborhood. So I know he was getting kicked out of his apartment. Are the chances pretty high that I would have that address also? If you, through your contacts, would have gotten a handle on the police report, you'd have the address for his apartment, yeah. Yeah, and that's what I would have done. I would have gotten it from my, I would have gotten it from my handler, mm-hmm. so. you go to his apartment. Would I happen to be able to recognize the area for the address to see if this is actually where his apartment was? It's not. So you know oh. the address of his apartment, and wherever this thread has died off at, it is not his apartment. All right, so I will pull out my cell phone and see where I am and take a screenshot so that I know to come back here if I need to. Okay. You do so. I'll leave you there for just a moment. Dante. Yes. um, It is early the morning of the 29th. You have tested all of your, you know, specific sort of equipment. Mm Mm-hmm. Your, your wires, your lines, your all of your accoutrement, as we would call it, all checks out well. Okay, great. From there, what are you doing? Have all of the, I guess, messages gone out to my guests? Yeah, are you sending messages to your um, the folks you met at the cafe as well? So yeah, I was well. I have I have Oliver's contact info. You do. So I was gonna send Oliver the information for the three tickets, how to get them, and like how to get in, where it is, and the like the venue, like you know the. Yep. Um. With a, uh, I guess a, a following message that says, um, "I'll be prepping for the show pretty much all day. So if it's important, reach out. Otherwise, I'll see you after the show." Okay. I, uh, I send back a okay. Nice. You get the okay. Cool. Then I put it out of my mind because I have no more bandwidth. Um, and then I will spend the rest of my time prior to the act uh, working with Sophie because I need her to. I need her to to help me stay limber. Um, and she is the best uh, flexibility coach one could hope to have. Yeah. So, me and my mink do floor exercises, and I do my I do my best. Okay, you're doing floor exercises. We're gonna jump back over to Echo Park really quick because I have to know what happened with the weird husk body that I created. Uh, Adam. Your neighbor is evidently dead, and from your life sense, you get the idea that he might have been dead for some time. Which begs the question, how was John firing a gun this morning? Who cleaned his trailer? And why? Why? And what is in this syringe, or what was in this syringe? All right, well... Adam's pulse has quickened a little bit by this point because, yeah, um, John is pretty much coyote food at this point. And you know what? We should. 
I don't know a lot of people around here, but we should probably take this as people who know a bit more than we do. What do you think? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that would be the right thing to do because uh, this is happening in your backyard. And if anybody finds out and you haven't done anything about it, I mean, like, you knew when all. But some people got sticks all the way up their asses that like go up the spines and come out their ears, and it's uh, it would it would be you know best to avoid. Well, I would like to avoid the ass sticks. So, um, uh, you know what? He puts a a hat like or John's bathrobe, pulls it up just a little bit, so he uh, kind of weekends at Bernie's him pair of sunglasses on, keeps him in the chair, puts a beer in his hand. All right, that'll buy us a half a day till the birds start to peck at him. I mean, why don't why don't you just put him back inside? Like you could you could just I like don't. put him back inside his trailer. I could, but then I'd have to go back in there. I really don't want to go back in there. I, I mean, I guess that's fair, but I mean, w- what if like if you're not going to feel bad when you come back and you see that a bunch of like neighborhood kids have drawn penises all over his face or something, then by all means, just go. He probably should have died somewhere else. So let's go. He walks over and gets in the car. I don't, I don't have a lot of time for sympathy. Come on, Jules, get in. Puts Jules on the console, hops into the old Buick. You hop into the old Carefully way. puts the syringe, the syringe in the glove compartment. So, Adam, where are you going? Actually, he's going to see if he can find Oliver. Oliver seems to have a lot more book smarts than Adam does. Um, and or a, mo- a bit more of an attachment to a fundamental set of people who know more than he does. And... Uh, he's pretty sure he doesn't live in a trailer park at the edge of the armpit of nowhere. So, yeah, that's a good place to start. Okay. So are you going to give him a call or? Yeah, I'm going to give him a call as I'm driving. Uh, okay. You know, probably talk quite loudly over the rattle and hum of the Buick. <laughs> that's a fantastic U2 reference. Thank you. And... Yeah, you, you get a call, Oliver. That was happening. Adam Montfrey, what's up? Uh, hey, listen, I got a really weird, and I mean real weird thing going on here. You, um, you got room for more and more wherever you're at? Uh, yeah, I guess. All right, um, shoot me the address. I'll be there in a few. Um, pick me up somewhere. Uh, I'll give him a address, like, a couple buildings down. Sure. Cool. And he goes and a few minutes later picks uh picks Oliver up. Hey, you know, just the guy I want to talk to you. I have uh Dante sent me the tick uh, information about the tickets for tonight's show. Oh shit, the show. Yeah. I forgot about the show. Yeah, okay. Uh great, great. Um we still have to figure out is Kaylee going? Well, do you know how to get a hold of Kaylee? I don't know. I think I think I received Kaylee's phone number at one point. But I think she also made explicitly clear that if I called her, she may stab me. So and, let's roll these dice. Text her. Good call. I'm still getting used to that. Hey, Suits. What's going on? There's a fucking bear in this car. There's a stuffed bear in this car. Oliver? Have we been uh, entertaining intoxicating beverages or other substances today? Unfortunately not. Jules, there's an old man in a suit sitting like right beside Oliver. Do you see the bear? The bear? The bear offers you a cigarette, but... Hey, hey, no smoking in the car. 
<laughs> Looks down at Jules. No smoking in the car. That was the agreement. If you need to smoke, I'll put you out on the hood. Just to be clear, Oliver, you can't see who Adam's talking to. That's fair. Uh, you know what? I, I talk to myself now, too, so. He, um, Adam pops up in the glove compartment. What do you make of this? He holds it by the paper bag. Uh, okay, I'll look in. Do uh, you see the aforementioned hypodermic needle? It, it's a needle. Well, there's something weird in it. Is it black tar heroin? You're not sure. I mean, I, I, I'm not really into heroin. Oh, well, then never mind. I'll put this away. I'm kidding. It's not heroin. I Listen, whatever this is, my neighbor was full of this shit. And he should have been dead. And I mean dead, dead, like 10 times over. And yet was still walking around and firing this behemoth. That's fucked up. Gestures to the hand cannon Civil War gun that is currently sticking out of his waistband. <laughs> Oh, I'm guaranteeing that's illegal, isn't it? Oh, great. That's going to be wonderful. Oh, shit. Oh, you're right. I didn't think about that. Hey, you uh, in the market for a new free gun? <laughs> We're going to pick up our story next episode with um, Adam and Oliver driving down a street with, with possibly, probably illicit drugs, an illegal handgun, and so much more fun in store for you, the listener. So thank you for joining us for this episode of Ascension of Babylon, our Mage of the Ascension Chronicle. We appreciate your listening ears. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>